What I will say is in my 20s, I definitely had a drinking problem. I now get it. Mm. You never get it when you're in the trial until yeah. you pass the trial. You know, I believe in there's a God or something, you know, a higher power. I grew up Catholic, but I was like, well, I'm not really like going to church anymore. And, and I remember just sitting there and God's like, hey, you're gonna, you might feel lonely right now. But trust me, where I'm leading you and who I'm going to surround you with is going to be so much better. I started studying them, hanging out with them, managing some of their properties. And by 2016, I felt ready to go. All right, guys, special treat for you today because I got Chris Luna on the podcast. Man, I've been watching you on social media. We both live in San Diego. We both have good presence online. Um, And I'm always looking for... People that have fruit in their life that are submitted to Jesus to bring onto the show. I think two or three people told me I needed to meet you. I needed to connect with you. So I I know it's not a coincidence you're here. And uh, it's been cool to watch because, guys, Chris is really successful in real estate. Uh, He also runs a backyard community teaching people how to build wealth through real estate. Uh, I always love when the people that are teaching or coaching have actually done it. He's actually done it. He's actually living it. Um, And, you know, he's done a lot of investing himself. But what's even cooler is what God is doing in your life right now and how you are going through this process of giving up alcohol and how that drew you closer to Jesus. And we're going to talk about it. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you for having me, man. It's an honor to be here. I've equally had heard a lot of good things about you. So it's cool to see uh, God moving the pieces around so that we could be here today. And come on. Yeah. It's cool too, you know, when you're walking out your assignment on this earth, Yeah, I believe God given, God begins to attract you to other people doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. There's power in proximity. There's power in relationships. There's power in community. You obviously know this. And I look around our community in San Diego. We're so blessed, dude. Yeah. We got some studs. We really do. <laughs> you know? It's, it's insane. I came here and I was like, I got to step my game up. Yeah. In a good way. In a good way. Like it pulls the best out of you. So yeah, man, I'm pumped to dive into it. So, uh, Chris, why don't you briefly tell the audience a little bit about your journey of, of kind of how you've gotten to where you're at as far as business acumen and success goes. And then after that, I want to go right into what's going on with alcohol and giving it up in this last year. And then I got some things planned after that. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, thanks for having me on the show, of course. And so, uh, my business journey started in 2011. Wow. 2011, I'm graduating from SDSU. Of course, I'm in a fraternity, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm either going to move home back to Sacramento, or I'm going to stay down here in San Diego with all the pretty girls. That's what my mindset back then. I'm thinking, (laughs) like, I don't want to go back up north. And so I'm like, okay, I got to stay down here, and what do I got to do to do that? Grandpa's, he makes a decision. He's like, hey, I'm going to cut you off. I'm like, okay, I got to start making money. So I did the one thing I knew, which was go on Amazon, type in iPhone 3 glass repair kit and bought the parts and I start fixing phones for friends and family. Entrepreneurial, I love Entrepreneur. it. Entrepreneur. I was like, I gotta I got I gotta pay the bills, right? I had rent to pay. Maybe rent in P B back then was like thousand bucks or something. Yeah, now it's three. It's a little more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But anyways, that's uh that's how I started in the entrepreneurial world and the business world. I learned a lot. I learned how to talk to customers. You know, people would call me, they'd be crying, they'd be mad, they drop their phone in the ocean. I'd have to solve a problem for them. And I, what I noticed was, I was like, okay, this is pretty scalable. I can fix 10 phones today, which at the time I thought that was scalable. I should have built these across the nation, but, you know, it's okay. God had me in that place for a season to learn how to operate a smaller business. And what I really took from that business was how to talk to people, how to become a salesman in a good way, you know, to to deliver a great product fast for a good price. And so that's what that first business taught me. Wow. A lot of people don't know that. That's I didn't know that. Yeah. A lot of people don't. I love that. Mine was, uh, I actually knocked on my neighbor's doors and I started doing landscaping and yard work. Nice. And then I employed another kid when we moved named DJ to work for me. Nice. And then we could knock twice as many doors to make twice as many sales and he could help me do the work. Yeah. And I paid him like two thirds of what I we were getting paid. So then I made that third on top of his. It was great. <laughs> What's crazy about that is me and my younger brother, when we lived at my grandma's house, uh, grandma and grandpa's house. We had the same lawnmower business, but our story's a little different. We had 
zero customers. <laughs> <laughs> and so you, we learned in there also that you need income on any business. You do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially equipment upkeep, all that. Yeah. You got to borrow from your parents. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So you started with that. How'd you go from fixing iPhones mm -hmm. to real estate? Great question. I mean, so uh, you know, I'm hustling and grinding on that business. All the while, I'm studying the real estate game. I'm seeing people like Brandon Turner, Grant Cardone, these big like behemoths in the real estate space, the, the titans. I'm like, if they could do it, I can do it too. And I was resonating with a lot of these people. And so I start studying the game maybe 2013, 14, 15. I have a few buddies, Garrett and Matt, Matt Holt, uh, shout out to them, great buddies of mine, who are already buying real estate. And the easiest way to do something is to latch on and learn from someone who's already successful in it. Yeah. And so I start studying them, hanging out with them, managing some of their properties. And by 2016, I felt ready to go. I had $40,000 saved up from the cell phone repair business. And I deployed that um, into a deal, $630,000 purchase. We came in with $120,000. We bought our first deal by San Diego State, me, Matt, and my buddy Kevin. Wow. And that was the start of a lot of deals after that. But I learned a lot just by doing that first deal. Uh, shortly later, you know, a few years later, I got my real estate license, start doing more investments around San Diego State, specifically one zip code. That's why I tell people, start in your backyard. The backyard doesn't have to be like your actual backyard, although we do build ADUs in our backyard. But when I say start in your backyard, that means start in your hometown, start in your region, right? Yeah. Where you know the area. And so that's how I got started. Wow. Yeah. Dude, I, I love what you shared because a few things. One, finding someone that's already done it and latching on. Mm -hmm. Power of mentorship, power of proximity. Proximity is power. You got around those guys. Now you're running a community mm -hmm. that people can get around you. What's the website for that? So it's backyardcommunity.com, backyardcommunity.com. And there we basically offer a group mentorship. It's two Zoom calls per week with me. I lead them. Uh, one call on Tuesdays is underwriting, which the guys I coached up, um, they are now leading those calls and I'm still providing a lot of value on what I'm learning through my deals, but those guys are running the calls and then I lead a call on Wednesday. So twice a week. And then we have access to our networking event, Mark cool. and Mingle and all the things. The second thing was you, and, and there's a book called Storehouse Principle. I don't okay. know if you've ever read it. It's an amazing book. My wife and I are going through it again right now together about having a storehouse, like saving money, being good stewards of our money God gives us for him to bless, mm. right? Like you can't buy real estate. I mean, I know there's a lot of ways to buy real estate, but you got you should save some money up, have some skin in the game. Yeah. And I think a lot of people struggle to have a storehouse. Mm. And I listen to you and I'm like, man, here's this young guy fixing iPhone, saves 40 grand to get in on a deal with two other guys to do his first flip to be in the real estate world. Mm -hmm. And I got my other buddy, Josh Bybera. I remember he bought like a, a multifamily unit and he saved up like 50 grand from his business. And I know another friend and I hear his story of getting in real estate. And he saved up like 40, 50 grand to get in. Um, I think it's really cool that you did that. Why do you feel so many Americans especially struggle to save 20, 30, $40,000 and get into real estate? Um, I think the common theme is we have a spending problem and that spending problem that's only on the surface. If you dig deeper down below, I'm like probably what happened to me and a lot of people, and we can get into that, is a lot of people don't feel enough or feel worthy. Mm -hmm. They're lacking something, probably lacking Jesus, but they're lacking something. And so they use external things. I'm guilty of this. The penthouse, the Range Rover, the Rolex, all the things. Although those are nice things and I've had those things, they do not create or they don't make me me. I make me me and I get my worth from Jesus. And so I think a lot of people... If you look at it, they they have a spending problem, and that's why they can't save that first fifty k. That's so good. Yeah. So, would you what amount would you say? I know San Diego is a little bit different of a market, but if someone listened to this was like, Chris, give me a number I should work hard to save to get into real estate. What amount would you say? That's a great question. Uh, recently, for what I do, they are bigger deals, and so I tell my guys like a hundred k is a solid number. It's really easy to do the math on a hundred k, fifteen percent return. You make fifteen thousand bucks, right? And so 100K is what I've recently, over the just the last few weeks, been preaching because if you pull together four people, 100K, we can go take down this deal, which requires 400K to buy a $1.5 million asset. Now, where I got started, it was 40K. I actually want to give a little tidbit trick that how I was able to save that. It was actually 50K, I think. I think I saved $962. 
I would have an auto transfer every Friday from my business checking to my personal savings, which I call a sacred storage account. I would not touch that money. It's your storehouse principle. Exactly. This book talks about it. Yeah, exactly. So I would never touch that money. And sometimes I would see my business account go negative and I would have to do what? Go back to the workplace, fix more phones, get that account back up. But you never transferred it back. Yeah. I wow. never touched the, the savings. The business could go like hit low and be there, but I stayed on my goal and within one year I was able to save up um, a good amount. Wow. And that's amazing. Yeah. Come on. That's so good. Well, then at the end of that, you talked about not, you know, you got the Range Rover, you got the penthouse, you got the Rolex, and I've been there in my own life and achieved all these things that I thought would make me happy, mm -hmm. and I found myself empty inside. Yeah. And you said, you got to have your identity in Jesus. But I want to even talk more about um, what you told me you feel called to speak on in this season, alcohol. Mm -hmm. Guys, alcohol, it's a valid conversation to talk yeah. about addiction. I want to just kind of give you the mic. Okay. To speak as a guy who's been walking through this journey, tell people, why'd you quit drinking? What's happened in the process? What can you share with us that we can learn from? And I actually believe somebody driving right now is listening to this podcast. They're going to hear what you're sharing and they're going to quit drinking. And their life's going to be changed because of what you're about to say. No yeah. pressure. Yeah, I know. I love it. I People really haven't um, asked me too much about my, my uh, non-drinking um, new habits. And so- let me think about where I want to start with this. What I will say is in my 20s, I definitely had a drinking problem. Mm. If I'm being vulnerable and honest, I would drink too much, wake up in the morning, regret some things, right? And so this ha and although I was very successful in business, I was still like there was a part of me that was just slowing me down every weekend. Um, and so it actually, the, the moment for me happened was back in August, I was uh, I was at a different church. I was not at Awaken. I was at Captivate, where I'd been going a few times, maybe two or three times. And a pastor got up there, and he started talking about his journey and how he stopped drinking. And, um, you know, his wife, now married to Sarah, but, like, they didn't talk for two years. They broke up. And, like, I start breaking down crying in the church. And at the time, I've, I've actually told this recently on my podcast, my solo episode. At the time, this girl I was dating, Tessa, was in town. And I didn't know the Lord that well at the time. But at the time, I was feeling very embarrassed because I'm out here crying. And this girl's next to me. And we had been maybe on like one or two dates. Yeah. It was like, I was kind of like embarrassed about it. And then she she was like very supportive. She's like, oh, go and talk to the pastor. So I would go and talk to the pastor. Happened to have the whole entire conversation recorded because I was recording his message that day. Wow. And I listen to it to, to this day and it always motivates me. But anyways, I go and speak with him. And ever since that day, I felt like God was talking through him, through that microphone to me directly. Come on. And I will never forget like like I was bawling in church. And so um, – Ever since then, that was August, I believe, 20th or 21st. I have not had any alcohol since that moment. And it's not even like I have to try. It's almost like God has put his hand on me and just removed it from my life. I have an event called Margarita and Mingle, and it's called Margarita and Mingle. I just mingle, or I drink a, a water or a virgin margarita. And so, you know, the Lord's really um, helped me. And I feel like he, he knew before, you know, this whole social media thing and like I'm gonna have influence and help a lot of people. It's like he he obviously knew he's the architect, the ultimate architect. He knew I needed to remove that to have the impact on the kingdom that he'd want to have through me. Wow. Yeah. Dude, that's so good. It reminds me of so drinking's an interesting thing for me because I've gone back and forth on it. Uh when I was twenty five I was dating a, a girl at the time. I would talk much publicly about this. I think I've shared it though on some podcasts now on public things. And we went up in Michigan and we went to a cabin. We were hiking waterfalls. We drank a glass of a bottle of wine, a whole bottle. And on the way back, we fell asleep. She fell asleep, then I fell asleep. And I got in a car crash. Oh, wow. Told my car, by grace of God, we were alive. And I got a DUI. Mm. I woke up the next day and um, that shook me because mm. I never thought I had a drinking problem. Yeah. And I was always like the more responsible one yeah. of my friends, I felt like. I still was a party boy, but I was I didn't want to take risks of liability if I didn't have to. And I remember I quit drinking for three, three and a half years, moved out here, built the most incredible life. And then I had started again now and then having a drink. But one thing that really shifted drinking for me and, and challenged me on, and I'll share this with you, I'm curious to talk, was 
the the ideology of leaders are held to a higher standard, which you just hit on with influence. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend who started preaching recently at our church. And uh, he, I'm an eMERGE captain over a men's ministry over a lot of guys. And we were out the night before eMERGE, just captains. And he shared a story with me that still this day rocked me, bro, about what you're saying. And I just felt like right now I should share it. Yeah. He was saying, you know, I um, it was Sunday. I was preaching my first message ever at church. And I invited a lot of my friends to come. And I had this friend who's been an atheist. I know he's an atheist. But he said he'd come because, you know, it was my first time preaching and we're good boys. We go back. And they also grew up Marines, college days, party and drinking, all of that. And he said he was on stage preaching this message. And I don't think he'll mind me share this. And he looked at the guy and he remembered him seeing him drunk and acting, you know, pretty dumb and wild a year before around his birthday. And God convicted him in that moment. What if this guy never comes to know Jesus or hear the words I'm speaking or the message I'm giving when he never goes to church, but he's here today because I was drunk in front of him. And all he can remember is, who are you to speak a message about Jesus? I remember you when. Yeah. And he said, ever since that day, I've held myself to a higher standard that if I'm going to step on stage with a microphone, that I don't get to live by the rules everyone else lives by. So good. And, and I think about that, and that's convicted me as, as a leader. If you're going to have permission to speak into people's lives, you have to be very careful with that influence. And I won't go as far as to say everyone that's drinking is doing something they shouldn't do. That's individually, I think, between you and God. I won't do that. But I will say, personally, I know that when I don't drink and I stick to that standard for my life, I'm a better leader because of it. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm hearing from you. Dude, your your social media is growing. You have influence. You you educate people. You teach people. You mentor people. And it's also knowing yourself. I also have a pastor who's in my life. We were in a, a sauna together not too long ago talking about drinking. Yeah. And he shared a different perspective. You know, he was a pastor over a big church. And he said, I know I can have one beer and be fine. And I also know my college buddies that now and then come around and see I'm a pastor and do all these things that I can show them that you can still have a beer and honor Jesus and be a pastor and do things. So we had a unique perspective of, because I'm not acting a fool. I don't do things. I do keep myself in check. I'm careful who I surround myself with. I don't put myself in situations where I'm going to compromise, right? Yeah. And I thought it was really interesting hearing both of these contrasts. So I'm curious your thoughts on, do you think everyone should quit drinking? Why? Do you think that some people like, I'm just kind of curious, like, what do you think about all that is shared? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's good. I'm happy you asked that because to answer your question, no, I don't think everyone should quit drinking, but I think if you have a drinking problem and I would indicate a drinking problem as in even like not a full on blackout, of course, but if you're like browning down and you're not sure how you got home, just, that's stop, a problem. just stop drinking. <laughs> yeah. Just stop, stop drinking. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I would say. If you can have one drink, great. And I think for me, um, you know, I could probably have one drink here here and there, but sometimes, you know, maybe the fifth or sixth time drink and one turns to two, two turns to three, and then that that's the issue. Yep. And so if I can just remove it all together, um, I always knew that would be good. What's crazy about all this is I try to do it for myself for years between, I would say around 2017, I start training for triathlons, half Ironman. And so I was using training for the triathlon so that I wouldn't be tempted to go out on the weekends. Oh, wow. This is before I came to know Jesus. You know, I, I grew up Catholic and, um, you know, did that, did that like kinder through 12 Catholic high school and elementary. But um, in college, in my 20s, I, I wasn't really going to church and I didn't have many friends around me who, um, who I can depend on. And so... Um, Forgot where I was going with that, but yeah, the, with the drinking and the um, how you you were training, yeah, and, and out to, to quit drinking. That's right. I was trying to do it by myself for for the longest time, and I'd go for you know three months, five months, go for a little bit. Things are good, and then I'd have that one night where it's like uh, kind of fuzzy. But it it wasn't really until um, just last year where it was completely well, removed. What shifted? God, mm. yeah, just like being in the word. Um, like knowing that like he loves me and created me intricately for like like who I am like he has a purpose for me and that like 
I don't know, just seeking him first in everything I'm doing has really been the game changer. Yeah. Now, you you mentioned growing up Catholic and this and that, trying to do things on your own accord, finding God, finding strength in that to quit. Mm -hmm. What shifted in your life to to bring you closer to Jesus? Like, was it going to church? Was it getting around some people that were following God? Like, what ignited that in you? Was it just you and your own time open in your Bible? Like, what did that look like? Yeah, it's it's early January 2023. I'd uh, gone to this seminar called Psy Seminar, and they do this little exercise and you draw a box, and I think the four corners were like spirituality, financials, emotional health, and relationships. And they ask you to look at which corner you're lacking in, which side. And so you kind of could end up with something that looks more like a triangle if you're lacking any of those. And I got really honest with myself. I'm like, okay, financials, I'm probably doing good. Uh, relationships, decent. Fitness, good. You know, And then I was looking at the spiritual side. I was like, well... You know, I believe in there's a God or something, you know, a higher power. I grew up Catholic, but I was like, well, I'm not really like going to church anymore. And so I, I realized there was this lack. I was missing something. Um, and I always I always felt that. Mm. And so that's what started it January 2023. Wow. And then uh, Liam, who ended up uh, working for me and then doing some, some stuff in the real estate community, he it's almost like the Lord was pursuing me through him because Liam kept reaching out to grab coffee and I was just kind of blowing it off don't have time not making time and then I sat with him and he invited me to church and uh, that was the start that was actually the first time I'd been to a Christian church wow yeah and uh that's that's when it all changed this was like April May 2023 come on yeah and then did you just go all in um you know I was going to church by myself uh college area Baptist church at first just by myself and then with Liam. And then one day he was like, let's go to Captivate. So I went to Captivate maybe two or three times. Then I feel like I had my living encounter with like a living God, like that Sunday, August 20th, 21st, 2023. And then I was going there for a little bit. And then one day, I think it was Max. Yeah. Yeah, Max was just, I felt like the Lord was pursuing me through him. And he kept reaching out to me. I kept seeing Awaken. I was like, we were actually driving, Tessa and I, to the College Area Baptist Church on a Sunday. I was like, Let's head north today. Holy Spirit just took over. Took wow. over the will and we we just headed north. And next thing you know, I was at Balboa Awaken. Come on. And uh That's where it happened for it, me. It, it, my life is so much better in just I don't know how, how much time that was, like much better. Yeah, yeah. Dude, come on, dude. Yeah. I remember when the first time I went to Awaken, I moved out here. I heard from three people to go there and you know, you can hear from God in any church, you know, it's not confined to that, but there was something different in the atmosphere mm. and pastor john was preaching yeah and uh i just knew i was like this is where i belong mm. these are my people yeah you know and then the next night was a pathfinder night and i was like wait you guys have like business nights at a church i was like sign me up yeah you know? and then i went there and i met like melissa higginbottom daniel wilgenbush daniel hack like all these great people and then the real shift have you been to men's prayer oh yeah Bro, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. where it, that's where my life changed. Emerged Tuesdays six a.m. Yeah, if you live in San Diego, Tuesdays six a.m. Awaken Balboa Campus Men's Prayer. I walked in and saw real men for mm -hmm. the first time in my life. Hundred biblical men sharing God stories, praying, worshiping God, getting together, breaking off addictions and things. And I was my life's never been the same, man. Yeah. That's so cool, dude. That's awesome. So, so since quitting drinking, what have some of the benefits been? Uh, the the clarity. Um, the there's no. I think sometimes when I would drink, there would be um, not just the fogginess the day after. Usually the day after, I'd be okay. But it's almost like that the the Tuesday or the Wednesday, the lethargicness, the the tired. Like I sleep a lot better. So when I'm sleeping a lot better, better I'm clear minded. Um, I would say I'm more emotional stable across the board not too many highs not too many lows like when i win i win when i take a loss i take a loss in the business world and i'm still i can stay steady through it mm. and i think the alcohol for me at least it um it could get me make me a little more emotional to say maybe losing a real estate deal or something like that yeah well and without it I i'm more stable so yeah. that's so good yeah and what is your intimacy with the lord look like have have you felt you get closer to him 
as you broke free of that, like, what has that walk been like for a year? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, some things I'm doing that, you know, uh, I, I've shared, like, I'm in the Word every morning. Um, that's been good. Um, men's prayer has been good. Uh, just, like, yeah, it doesn't even have to be any of these, like, things that are on the calendar. Like, I think yesterday I was on a walk, and I just started talking to the Lord. I'm like... Mm-hmm. Hey Lord, like thank you for for getting me that deal the other day. I I appreciate it. I wasn't sure if that was the one, and I actually was like, hey, I know I was a little anxious. You know, I was a little anxious. I know that wasn't from you, and I was, I need to remember not to be like that. Um, but I was anxious. Like, am I going to get this deal? I need to remember. Like, if I don't get this deal, it's because you got something else for me. And so having little intimate moments like that on a car drive here, for instance, or, um, just wherever it's um. God is always present. He's always with you. He's always listening and he always wants the best for you. And so if you know that, you can talk with him and he can give you that little bit of advice you know you need to hear. Yeah, dude. Come on. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you, I think you develop a peace in your life when you have an intimacy with your father. They say a peace that surpasses all understanding. Mm. And it's so cool. I'm curious, um, how important do you feel being in proximity and good community and guys like Max and men's prayer has, has been for you going from, and I would say probably a lukewarm, you know, Christian Catholic to really be like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to know God. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to walk with God. How important has that proximity and that community been for you? Super important. We have our small connect group. Um, and then we also have the golden Eagles brotherhood and shout out to golden Eagles, golden Eagles. What's up? Shout out Mac, shout out Pat and all the boys, you know, it's been super, super important because, um, one thing is people hold you accountable, you know? And so people have different addictions and things that that they can get into. And so when you have brothers holding you accountable based on what the word says and what God would say to do in any situation, it's all there. All the wisdom is there for us. They help you. And also sometimes I think as an entrepreneur, it could be a lonely road, you know, it could be. And so you could get closed off and that's where the enemy likes to get you. He wants you by yourself so that he could speak the lies into your ears and 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 tell you you're not good enough. You're not worthy. This business idea is not going to work. And so when you have brothers around you telling you the opposite or pastors like, you know, um, telling you and speaking life into you, speaking wisdom, you're going to be you're going to be a lot more at peace with yourself but you're going to accomplish your goals and whatever God has like in store for you and, and plan for you, you're going to be able to get, get what he wants for you. Yeah. And so I think having brothers is, it's huge for a while. I actually felt a little lonely. I've told Max this, like for a while I, I, that you go through that point where it's like, okay, I'm not drinking anymore. So you still have those buddies and those friends that you can go out with them, but maybe they, maybe you don't get the invite to things anymore, right? So I was in this period where it was like, okay, I'm not really hanging out with them, but not tapped into the Christian um, brotherhood I have with the Golden Eagles. I'm kind of in this gray area, and it could get lonely. Yeah, and so seeking the Lord in that it's moment. like a wilderness we have to wander through, the desert. You 100%. know, percent. I remember going through that when I so after that DUI and all that happened. I was building in business, but I just dedicated my life just almost obsessively, obediently, no drinking, no partying, just building my life, getting everything on track I could. And it was the loneliest season of my entire life. Yeah. Like that really was a struggle. And I remember seeing like everyone's social media Mm -hmm. stories and posts and people having fun. And I remember uh, a friend did reach out to me. It was Halloween right before I moved out here because I moved a few months later and he invites me to his Halloween party. And I was like, man, I, I don't party anymore. He's like, just come hang out, dude. We're going to play games. You know, I'm like, all right, it'd be good to get around people, right? I've been yeah. kind of isolated in the office at home. Yep. And I remember going, and I'm there an hour and a half. And people are already just getting wasted and partying and doing drugs. And I remember looking around and just feeling God say, like, this isn't where I want you. Mm-hmm. And I just had this moment. I was like, hey, man, you know, I appreciate you inviting me, but I'm going to head home. And I go to home like at like 730. You know, like I got there at 6, left at 730. And I remember just sitting there and God's like, hey, you are you might feel lonely right now, but trust me, where I'm leading you and who I'm going to surround you with is going to be so much better. That's good. And just finding peace in that and walking that out. And then you do find those people. Mm. But for someone listening to this, I think it's good to encourage them with your story, with my story. Guys, if you want to break old habits, 
there's going to be a season of loneliness and wilderness Mm -hmm. of leaving behind what was to make room for what will be. And uh, don't give up. Galatians 6, 9 says, do not grow weary in doing good for in a proper time you shall reap a harvest. Very oftenly just referred to in finances and business, but it goes for every area of our life. Don't grow weary in breaking a bad habit. Don't grow weary in getting away from negative influences in a proper time. A harvest is good fruit, right? You don't harvest something if it's not like good. Yeah. You know, if, if it was tainted with worms or something, you wouldn't harvest it. But if it's a good crop, a good fruit, you're going to harvest it. And you're going to get a return for it. And I just see that that's what you've done. Yeah. You like lasted through that. You have good harvest, good fruit now. I mean, Golden, those guys, Pat, Max, some of my best friends, some of the best guys I know. 100%. Yeah. And uh, I want to add to that because I see this plant here and I think about the plant I have at my house. Um, and Pastor Becky was talking about this and at the Mission Valley campus. Like sometimes you can't see the fruit, right? Like it's below the soil. Yeah. And I actually had this little plant. I wish I had a photo of it. And below, like I was going to pull out the roots because I didn't see anything growing. I'm like, man, this thing's done. So I consider pulling it out. And then I kid you not, like I'm starting to see the green come up. I'm like, I'm so happy I didn't <laughs> rip that out because it's coming back to life. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. It's it's like, uh, I don't know if you ever listen to Les Brown. Yeah. Motivational speaker. Mm-hmm. He used to talk about the Chinese bamboo tree. You ever heard that one? Yeah. And I always think about that, like the Chinese bamboo tree, you know, the guy waters it for five years. It never pops out of the ground. Yeah. And then in 30 days, it grows 80 feet tall. I wonder if I have a bamboo tree. It kind of looks like it. kind of, you yeah. might, bro. You might uh, have a Chinese bamboo yeah, tree. It might be. <laughs> <laughs> and it grows extremely fast. So that's yeah. so cool in life. Man, that's so good. Yeah. Um, There was something else oh, I wanted to hit on. It's so interesting. You mentioned accountability. Mm-hmm. I was driving the car and actually it's on my story right now on Instagram. I I had this revelation from God and I think it's because of this podcast we were going to do. And it was men don't want to make promises, commitments, or get around good godly men because they don't want to be held accountable to their actions. Mm. And one of the things I've realized as a man is we need that. Yeah. We need to be held accountable for the way we live our life, the actions that we take. And the only way to have accountability is for one, promises or commitments, and two, getting around people that will speak into you and call you to a higher standard when the life you're living or the actions you're taking don't align with who they know you to be. Yeah, that's good. And and I f- do you feel like, I mean, for you, you've stepped into that now. I think even in accountability, there's times in, I don't know how long you've been in accountability, there's times you get um, lightly rebuked or reprimanded in a healthy way by somebody or someone speaks into you a constructive criticism that in the moments can suck. Like when they when like my pastor sits me down and says, Hey Cody, I noticed this story on your Instagram wasn't in alignment with the man I know you to be. Mm. Ugh. Uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. You know, almost like and then there's even that 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 the sinful side of you, like who are you to and then there's that humility of I'm so grateful I have a pastor that will take me out to lunch and call me out. When I'm not being the man I should That's be. That's amazing. That's accountability. Yeah. Most men don't want it. Yeah. And and now, so what is, what is, I'm just curious for you and your journey, um, has it been hard for you to start getting that accountability now? Um, no, I, I think in the past it would have been. I would have taken offense to anyone saying anything about my life just maybe two years ago, a year and a yeah. half ago. I would have taken offense and guard would go up. And so, and then maybe I would shut down and, and maybe just not take that very well. Way different now. So yeah. like yesterday, I think I was at the gym and like someone was like, Hey, did you do that set yet? Like he asked me and I was like, Oh, that's accountability. I like that. Thank you. And so I did the set. And so, um, no, now it's easy. It's like, especially if I know that their intent is, Hey, I just want what's best for you. And I know who you are. So do the set, do the rep, make the call, you know, whatever it is. So, uh, no accountability is not a thing. Now I will say I was out, uh, I don't know, maybe a month ago for a buddy's birthday. And we had a late night out and I don't drink, but I'm still having there having fun. And I created a little video and I, I send it out into the world. And, you know, on some of my stories, I have 800,000 people see these things. I, I thought to myself, I, what, like, what was my intent with sharing that? Like, was I providing value? Was I, was I wanting people to see me having a good time because maybe think that all I do is business? Like, what was the point of posting that? But something in me, actually, after I posted it, I didn't feel good about it. I was like, what am I really trying to do here? Like, well, And it was a late night out. And sure, I didn't drink. But you know what? The next day, 
I missed church. I didn't show up. Um, I felt tired. I actually felt, I didn't feel hungover, but the yeah. smoke in the air, I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, the word of God says, talks about being like above reproach. Mm-hmm. You ever heard that? Yeah, I've heard it. Because but... uh, basically being above reproach is not putting yourself in a situation where someone can assume you're sinning even if you're not mm-hmm. reproachable. Yeah. Even though you might not have been drinking, very easy to think, oh, he's a party boy. Yeah. Oh, he's gone back. Yeah. Oh, he's relapsed. Yeah. Oh, he's, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or if you're trying to not, you know, if you're walking the walk of obedience of not sleeping with a woman before marriage, mm-hmm. but yet you take a vacation with a woman mm-hmm. and you share a video and you're in the same hotel room together, even if you're not sleeping together, well, common person would say, oh, they are. Yeah. Make an assumption. I struggled with that. Me too, bro. Dude, because I, I was like very much like I'll live my own life. And I I moved out to San Diego and I actually broke off lust and stopped having sex. I never slept with my wife before I married her. I never had sex here in San Diego. Like I walked that, that walk. It was hardest thing because you come out here and it's like everyone's gorgeous. You know, there's like so many women. But it was like an obedience that God had. But one thing that I had to learn because I was like, God, I'm, I'm good. I'm not going to sleep with my girlfriend. But we took a trip to Hawaii with friends. So my philosophy was like, well, if we have friends go and we stay in separate rooms, I'm honoring God. And I got sat down and said, you're an emerged captain and a leader of men. And you took a vacation to Hawaii with your girlfriend. And even though you might not have slept with her, what assumption in um, example are you setting for them? You might have the willpower to not sleep with your girlfriend. Most men on vacation in Hawaii, don't have the willpower to not do that. Higher standard, Mm. right? Leadership, higher standard. Influence, higher standard. 800,000 people see your story, higher standard. Man, I wish more men with influence like you would submit themselves to the Lord because the world would be such a better place. 100%. Amen to that. That's uh, It makes me think of like when I was in... um, you know, I've done some vacations with a girl girl that I was dating at the time, and, and we were pure in everything we did as well. And uh, some things that came up that I struggled with because, you know, I'm, I'm coming from the worldly world at that point. It's like, no, like, let's go all stay in the same Airbnb together like I used to do in past relationships, and that's something we wouldn't do. We'd have to stay in completely separate hotel rooms. And so, like, I've walked that walk. And I remember actually as a, a newer Christian struggling with that. That's a hard one for guys. She was she was fine. She's like, no, this is how everyone out here in my community, this is like, it, it would be weird. And so, you know, we've stayed in some Airbnbs at first with separate rooms and we were good about that. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it, it was hard. But now I, I, I see it very clearly now. Yeah. Take a step back, have a little more wisdom on me, got accountability, yep. hearing other people and, and their stories. And so... Um, in a new relationship, I'd be able to execute on that and, and glorify God and, and put, and it's first. worth it. dude. Yeah. Obedience precedes blessing. So yeah. I took that one trip, you know, there, and, um, I think we might've had done a road trip somewhere to like camping or something. And my wife's father is a pastor, Okay, but he doesn't like pastor church anymore. Missionary evangelist. They used to have a church at a Bible college that raised up a bunch of pastors very much by the book of God. And I respect him so much. So I'm walking out everything, you know, I can write. Like my wife saved herself for marriage, like her entire life. Like we're being obedient. And I finally go to ask for his blessing to marry his daughter. Mm-hmm. And I secretly, my wife thinks I'm going to Texas for a business trip. I fly to Miami. I stay with her parents. Yeah. And I asked their blessing and he told me no. And I was like, why? Boy, I feel like I <laughs> could not be a better, I could not have earned a better right to marry your daughter. I'm like doing everything I possibly can. Yeah. And he's like, we have some expectations of you. Don't post pictures on. So we posted a picture in Hawaii kissing. Mm. And he's like, you're not above reproach. And he took the trip. So his expectations are simple. Don't post pictures like that. Don't travel with my daughter. Build a relationship with me and call me every week. And in six months, we'll revisit this. Wow. And I was so <laughs> offended yeah. when I went to my room in their house that night. Yeah. I was so like, ah, oh, you know. Yeah. Of course, said the right things. Of course, I'm going to do it. Of course, I'm going to honor him. And I was I remember putting the date six months of the day in my phone. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to show you. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and God just humbled me through that. And, dude, it was such a, a hard six months because my wife was like, do you not? She didn't know. She's like, do you not love me? Do you not want to marry me? Why haven't you, mm. you know, proposed to me not knowing like, 
Oh, well, I'm trying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I have to please your dad. Yeah. And I felt like Jacob, thank God it wasn't like 16 years or whatever, then marry the wrong daughter and have to go back to work for the dad again. Yeah, yeah. You know, that whole story. Um, but it, I come out of that season now, a married man who never slept with his wife, who thought he did everything right, got corrected twice by a pastor, by my father-in-law, had to wait six more months to propose to my wife. And I can tell you on the other side of that, I now get it. Mm. You never get it when you're in the trial until yeah. you pass the trial. Yeah. But now I'm like, I can't wait till someone wants to marry my daughter. You know, like, because yeah. there's a standard you hold a man to, accountability. And if the man can um, handle the pressure of the accountability and, and do what's right and make right on it and walk it out, who he becomes afterwards is a better man. Wow. I love that. And that's probably, I actually, I needed to hear that. So I appreciate that. Yeah, dude, it's that's for good. you, bro. That's, that's why we brought you here today. Yeah. Really, dude, it's for that. I love it. So man. you're single right now? Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Well, just know the man that you are, are becoming right now, the woman that you attract will be so much better. Oh, yeah. It'll be incredible, dude. And you'll hold a, a standard of that. And, dude, I will say, man, I, I don't know if we've talked about it much on this show, but not having sex before marriage as men needs to be talked about more. 100%. Because if you're sleeping around the world, getting it on with every girl that you can, you're never going to find what you're actually looking for. The true hole that we seek to fill as men, God wired, Adam was put on this earth, created in God's image and his likeness. And then God looked and said, oh no, it's not good for you to be alone. Mm. You're not meant to just go build multi-million dollar businesses, make a bunch of money, be successful, to have a relationship with God and die. Yep. God knew, oh, I didn't realize Adam needs love just like I need love. I believe God created man because he wanted to be loved. Mm. I believe that God put... You know, there, there's this this intimacy of of God loves to be worshipped. He loves to be praised. He loves to be loved. He loves when we say, God, I love you. Yeah. And he wanted to love us. And then he puts Adam here and he's like, oh, dang, you need that too. You need that too. You need yeah. it too, right? And it's not, even though it's crazy to say, and some Christians might push back on me, this is my opinion, just being loved by God as a man, even though in some ways, yes, it's enough, but it's also not. Because you will live your entire life never knowing what it's like to have completion of man and woman. Mm. And and so I say that because, man, as men, if we truly live that out and walk that journey, we won't have a bunch of kids that don't have fathers in their life. Yep. We won't have broken homes like we have. And we'll have men that actually clean their act up and start walking obediently to God, building an intimacy, and then forming a healthy marriage on sturdy Foundation. Grout foundation. Yeah, it's good. And then from there, healthy family. When you have healthy family, everything else in life improves. 100%. I love that. Spot on. Come on. Cody for mayor. Let's go. Let's, let's get, <laughs> I don't know about change. mayor. Let's get Cody into politics. <laughs> we need a change in our politics. Do. I, I don't want to sign up for yeah. it unless the Lord calls me to it. I love it. Um, Chris, so as you know, I, I would love you. You've been successful, man. We got probably about like 10 minutes or so left. Yeah. What are some some things you could share with the audience on this podcast when it comes to building wealth? Yeah. I know I'm changing the direction. We just talked about not having sex before marriage, <laughs> but now I am going to transition into, I mean, how old are you? 36. You're 36 yeah. and, and people would aspire to be where you're at. There's a lot of people, you know, not a lot of people will truly build wealth and real estate can be a tough industry. What advice and wisdom can you speak into me speak into the audience when it comes to wealth creation yeah i've never really said this because it's just something that's been on my heart to say lately because i feel like i've read it um but god in, in his word he, he asks us to multiply what we're given yeah i don't know what scripture it is i get yeah, there's a lot but i i just know i've, I've read that and so with real estate that's that's what i do i can take forty thousand dollars and can turn it into let's call it three extra turn one hundred and twenty thousand dollars and um, what we do specifically in the real estate industry is we build accessory dwelling units by right, meaning no one can really stop us from doing it. And the city wants us to do it to help provide good, clean housing, new housing, because the most of San Diego was built in the 50s, 60s. And so that's what we do. We lean into that and we do multifamily developments. We call it ADUs, but really it's multifamily development. We'll go and add six units and just create a, a new space. Uh, clean stainless steel appliances. It's beautiful, right? And we provide housing for people. And it's a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of effort. You got to raise capital. You have to have deal, debt, equity, and you piece all this stuff together as an operator. And then you got to go and manage that asset 
but you get paid well to do it if you know how to do it correctly. And so that's what we've identified as a great opportunity. I think the best, a lot of people say don't invest in California. They say, go, go put your money in um, I don't know, these other states where there's higher cash flow. And although I do agree with them on some of the bigger multifamily deals, if you want forced appreciation, there's no better market in the entire in America than San Diego right yeah, now, the right now. because they're pro-ADU development, and that's what allows us to do what we do. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, so you're big on it. And, you know, have you ever heard of Chris Aguilar? I have, yeah. Chris is a good friend of mine as well. He's very pro investing in California. It's funny, you're both named Chris. Yeah. You're the two guys I've heard speak the most about investing in California if you live in California. Yeah. It's interesting because me and my wife were heading towards that looking so you feel the ADU, the ability to do that is a big advantage. So if my brain's understanding this right, I can go buy a property in San Diego that I probably try to get a deal on that I'm doing some fix up on that's also appreciating it when I reappraise it, cash flow, but I can also build extra units on that property through our ADU laws to build my cash flow and what it's worth. Is, is that correct? Exactly. And so a lot of what I do specifically is 92109 Pacific Beach. I'll go buy a three unit or a four unit, which only takes up a portion of a 7,000 square foot or 6,500 square foot parcel. Now, what I do with all that that land? Well, I go vertical there and there's a, a height limit in, in the Coastal Commission of 30 feet, but we'll go and add 680 use and then say each one's worth 500, 600 K you've increased your equity or your net worth by call it two, three million bucks. Wow. And you, if you do that over time, like- Are you are you buying, doing that, flipping and selling and exiting the deal or are you folding and cash flowing the units? Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of what I did early on was San Diego State and I always said I'd never sell. So we buy a home for 600, put 200K into it. And we, we end up selling those properties being all in for 800K for like 1.6, 1.7. When the market was. Yeah, exactly. 2021, we start selling off a lot. For me, my investment strategy is if it's west of Ingram, I want to keep it long term. Rents go up, borrow against it, continue to do this model. If it's east of Ingram or in different markets, I'd gladly flip it and sell it. Okay. Kind of depends on the location. Because PB is such a high rental market yeah, and it's by the beach. You see the value of holding the asset, and yeah. flowing it. Yeah, like I just think about if I, you know, when I die someday, if my kids were able to inherit my properties, I'd want them to have great assets in great locations. I did not feel that at San Diego State. There's trash everywhere. Tenants um, could be a little bit higher turnover ratio. Yes. They mess up the homes. I was like, I don't feel good about this. And so the spirit, like how I feel about PB, I feel stoked. I feel stoked on them. You know, Daniel Hack. I did. Yeah, dude, uh, what I love about you and Daniel, um, y'all are taking territory in PB, which is pretty much known as the party beach around here. But I'm seeing godly men building like, um, uh, I, I prayed over Daniel the first day he got the keys to Matt Beat. Nice. We went in with a group of guys and laid hands on him and prayed over the business. And God showed um me that Matt Beat was a lighthouse in PB. And I started seeing all these like white houses on the map here in San Diego, business owners building altars and building, you know, white houses that were pushing back the darkness. And I think you get an opportunity to do that as a landlord. Wow. I have not even been thinking like that, but I love that you said that. Actually, I want to add to that. Yeah. I do a lot of walking because I tell people to start in their backyard. When you can walk and be boots on the ground, that's where I get the most excitement. I can meet my neighbors. Um, I can buy their properties. I can meet the tenants. And so I'm walking down, I think it's Thomas Thomas Street, uh, Labor Day weekend. Okay. And I see a church. I'm like, oh, that looks pretty cool. I go on LoopNet later on looking for office space, and I happen to see the same church on Thomas. I'm like, oh, dang, it's for lease. I was like, let's bring Awaken to Pacific Beach. Why not? Why not? Yeah, why not, right? You know what? Maybe one day you're going to hand the keys to a building. Because you build so much wealth in real estate, yeah. that you'll be able to donate an entire church yep. to, you know, Awaken or another church and say, hey, I just want to bless you and give you a church. Yeah. That's vision. It'd be so cool to do it in PNB where, like you said, like it's it's full circle. Like all the drinking and all the stuff I was doing in my 20s that was not living a fulfilling life. Like it's so much different now to come back with this lens with my belief, my belief in like who I am, who Jesus created me to be, it's just so so much better. And we'll come back to PB now. Let's go, Chris. This yeah. is so good.
I think that for any aspiring entrepreneurs or business owners, there are going to be some lonely times. It is going to fit you. You may feel like you, you aren't enough, you know, because you're going to compare yourself. That's something I dealt with that I don't talk about. Um, like I was always comparing myself to my friends who, who maybe they had parents with money. So they had like a little head start. Right. And so I was always comparing myself, which brought down how I felt about myself. And so if I went through that, there's probably someone out there going through that. And I think that comparison is a thief of joy. Is that, is that the, yeah. yeah. Is that good? I got it. I got it. I got, yes, that's good. Here you go. Um, so, you know, to get out of that comparison game is crucial. The sooner you can do that, I think you're going to live a more fulfilled life and be happier. You're going to move with a little more confidence. And I think that's, that's, that's huge. Dude, that's so good, man. Yeah. That's so good. Where can we connect with you on social? I'm on uh, Instagram is where I'm the most active. Chris J. Luna. Chris J. Luna. I'm also on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, backyardcommunity.com. Uh, I'm all over on social media. Let's go, man. Yeah. It was an honor having you on the podcast. I mean that, Chris. Uh, such a showerful episode. Thank you for your yes. I know that people's lives will be changed because of it. And to the person listening to this or watching it on YouTube, I just want to challenge you. Don't just be the person that just becomes a personal development junkie and listen to podcasts after podcasts. Knowledge means nothing if you don't implement it. Knowledge isn't power. Applied knowledge is power. Take something from today's episode. Reflect maybe even turn the podcast off before going to the next. Sit with it for five, 10 minutes and say, God, what was one or two nuggets I could walk away with from that podcast? And how can I walk that out in my life? And still call to call some of you to do that and take that action. I don't do this just to make content. <laughs> I do this because I want to change lives. And then if you got value from today's episode, share it with somebody. A simple share of a good piece of information that can go into someone's life can change their life. Years ago, someone sent me a podcast. And because of that podcast, it got me back into developing Cody. And because I got back into developing Cody, it changed the trajectory of my entire life. So good. You got to get hard, man. You're going to help a lot of people. Thanks, man. Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me on the show, man. It's been a blessing and... Uh... Let's keep growing. Let's go. Let's go. Boom.